สวัสดีค่ะขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่การเปิดตัวหนังสือ South South in Action Capacity Building for Climate Action in South East Asia ซึ่งหนังสือเล่มนี้เป็นการนำเสนอตัวอย่างในการดำเนินงานด้านการพัฒนาศักยภาพด้านการเปลี่ยนแปลงสภาพภูมิอากาศในภูมิภาคเอเชียตะวันออกเฉียงใต้ที่ดำเนินงานโดยศูนย์วิชาการนานาชาติด้านการเปลี่ยนแปลงสภาพภูมิอากาศหรือ CITC ภายใต้การดูแลของ TGO ค่ะกิจกรรมนี้ได้รับการสนับสนุนจากองค์การความร่วมมือระหว่างประเทศแห่งญี่ปุ่นและหนังสือเล่มนี้ได้รับการสนับสนุนให้ตีพิมพ์จากสำนักงานสหรประชาชาติเพื่อความร่วมมือใต้ใต้หรือ United Nations Office for South South Cooperation ค่ะก่อนจะเริ่มกิจกรรมในวันนี้ดิฉันขอแจ้งให้ทุกท่านทราบว่ากิจกรรมในห้องนี้จะเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะคะท่านสามารถเลือกฟังเสียงจากล่ามได้ที่หมวดการเลือกภาษาที่อยู่ด้านล่างของหน้าจอค่ะกุ๊ดมอร์นิ่งเลดี้สแอนด์เจนท์เมนต์มายเนมอีสวันนบุญคนอาจเทคนิคอลเอ็กซ์เพรสฟรอมไทยแลนด์เกรนเฮาส์แก๊สแมネจเมนต์ออร์แกไนเซชันหรือ TGO I am very pleased to be the MC for this event Welcome everybody to the virtual launching event of the UNO SSC SSIA publication Title: South South in Action: Capacity Building for Climate Action in Southeast Asia. Before starting the event, I have a few housekeeping notes to make. Firstly, I would like to seek your cooperation to ensure your microphone is muted. Secondly, during the panel discussion, the chat will be open for questions. If you have any question or comment during the event, please put it into the chat box. And thirdly. This event will be organized in English. If you want a Thai interpretation, please select the language button below the screen. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention, ladies and gentlemen. There will be three sessions at this event, starting with opening remarks by representatives from the UNO SSC, JICA Thailand, and TGO. Next, there will be the introduction of the SS publica SSIA publication. And the last session will be the panel discussion on South-South cooperation and enhancing NDCs in Southeast Asia region. Firstly, may I first start the, the first session and request Mr. Adel Abdel Latif, UNO SSC Director at Interim, Mr. Morita Takahiro, Chief Representative from JICA Thailand, and Mr. Ket Chai Maitri Wong, Executive Director from TTO. To give the opening remarks, please starting with Mr. Adel. Mr. Kia Chai Mei Triwong, Executive Director TGO. Mr. Morita Takahiro, Chief Representative JICA Thailand. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to be part of the launch of this South South in Action publication, focusing on capacity building for climate actions. In Southeast Asia, for four years, South South in Action publication have given a voice to the United Nations Office South South Cooperation Partners, facilitating the sharing of stories with regard to their own South South and Triangle Cooperation initiatives. In the Asia Pacific region, we are proud to have prepared eight publications with governments, intergovernmental organizations, non-state actors, and private sector. Stakeholders, I would like to acknowledge the partnership with the Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization (TGO) and the government of Thailand in general, as well as the Japan International Cooperation Agency (JICA) for leading the compilation of this volume of South South in Action. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of UN entities, including UNDP and UNFCCC. And their leadership in climate action. As TGO will introduce the content of this publication in detail, I would therefore emphasize the importance of climate action in the context of South-South and Triangular Cooperation. During the recently concluded 20th session of the High-Level Committee on South-South Cooperation, many delegations underscored their renewed commitment to multilateralism. Noting that global crises, including the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, 
could not be resolved by countries working in isolation. It is clear that climate change affects us all, but not equally. The 2016 World Economic and Social Survey report entitled Climate Change Resilience an opportunity for reducing inequalities indicates that developing countries are much more affected by climate change and low-income countries are more vulnerable, suffering the greatest loss. The COVID-19 pandemic also brings new challenges to this existing problem. Mobility restrictions, economic downturns, and disruptions to the agricultural sector have exacerbated the effects of climate-related disasters along the food supply chain. The delivery of humanitarian assistance when extreme climate events have struck has sometimes been delayed due to the pandemic, <coughs> thus exacerbating negative impacts. The overlap between the pandemic and climate-related disasters demonstrates the need for a multi-layered response to the climate change challenge compounded by the vulnerability of many communities in developing countries. A survey conducted by the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation, Asia-Pacific Regional Office in 2020, indicated that for the Pacific countries, an urgent concern is ensuring that environmental and climate challenges are addressed during COVID-19 recovery. The Asia-Pacific region in many ways is on the front line of a changing climate. Although many countries suffer from huge climate impacts due to geographical and capacity constraints, they are also tuning the tide for more ambitious climate action. I am pleased to note that developing countries in this region have scaled up their efforts and are promoting South-South and Triangular cooperation to achieve climate ambitions. The successful stories showcased in, the, in this South-South Action publication are an example of the important role that South-South and Triangular Cooperation are playing <coughs> in addressing climate change. The United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation stands ready to continue working clo closely with TGO, JICA, and partners in the Asia-Pacific region to extend capacity building efforts Finally, I wish to once again congratulate TGO and JICA and extend my best wishes to all participants for the, for the rest of this event. Thank you. Mr. Adel Abdel Latif, Director at Interim UNOSSG. Mr. Kyachai Maitriwan, Executive Director, TGO. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, Sadiqa. My name is Takahiro Morita, Chief Representative from JICA Thailand Office. On behalf of JICA, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this launching event of the publication related to our cooperation at the Forum of Sustainable and Reliable Low Carbon Cities organized by TGO. First of all, I'd like to thank TGO and UNOSSC for their dedicated work in creating such a wonderful publication and organizing this event. As we are all aware, today we are amid the most menacing global challenges, COVID-19 and climate change. Both of them pose imminent threats to the society, to our health and well-being, and to of a way of life. On the other hand, they have made us realize the importance of international cooperation more than ever before. While no single nation can stay safe from the pandemic and solve the program on their own. In the same way, climate change, mitigation and adaptation are endeavors that no country can achieve alone. Ladies and gentlemen, in the field of climate change, Japan has demonstrated strong commitment and outstanding contribution to the international society for several years. And we, JICA, as an implementing agency of the Japanese official development assistance, have praised climate change as one of the priorities 
in our assistance strategy. We consider capacity building as one of the fundamental factors for ensuring successful implementation of climate policies and actions. Our cooperation with TGO is a great example. Officially, there was 10 years of technical cooperation in three phases beginning in 2010, and an officially a long-lasting partnership. Above all, the establishment of the Climate Change International Technical and Training Center, OCITC, in the second phase of our cooperation in 2014, marked an important milestone with aim of becoming a center for networking and interactive knowledge sharing for the realization of low carbon growth of the ASEAN economies. By adopting a unique triangular cooperation approach through the technical and training center, TGO, CITC, and JICA have been working together to carry out capacity building and networking activities, including training, seminars, regional events, and knowledge dissemination targeted at government officers, students, and the private sector in Thailand and ASEAN. Also, JICA's technical cooperation project ended in September 2020. We do believe that we have successfully enhanced the implementation of climate change actions throughout the region, as we have witnessed the steady growth of this regional capacity building platform. The CITC experience proves that a regionalized approach to capacity building in the context of South-South and Triangular cooperation can be deemed effective for facilitating and expediting climate actions. In this respect, it is our great honor to share this publication, which illustrates the number of ways that TGO and the CITC climate change capacity building is undertaken in the ASEAN region. And we do hope this publication will help to promote mutual learning and cooperation among stakeholders. In closing, once again, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to TGO and UNOSSC for their hard work in this endeavor. Thank you very much, Kopkun Makra. Good morning, Mrs. Siochun Kenswang, Deputy Director, United Nations Office for South South Cooperation, or UNOS. Mr. Morita Takahiro, Chief Representative of Japan International Cooperation Agency Thailand Office, or JICA Thailand. Distinguished panelists, representative from UNDP, the UNFCCC Secretariat, and dear colleagues. On behalf of Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization, public organization, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the virtual launching event of the UNOS publication on South South in Action, Capacity Building for Climate Action in Southeast Asia. As we are aware, capacity building is one of the fundamental blocks for ensuring successful implementation of climate policies and action to meet the goals of Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. South-South and Triangle Cooperation enables developing country to voluntarily assist each other in strengthening capacity building and actions to tackle climate change. In 2014, Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization launched the Climate Change International Technical and Training Center, or CITC, to serve as a knowledge hub and training platform 
on climate change to fulfill the needs of ASEAN stakeholders on climate change implementation. I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to JICA for their fully support on this center. And as a result of the successful execution of the CITC, TCO decided to expand our capacity building activities and collaboration by integrating the CITC and other training and outreach programs into a newly established called TGO Climate Action Academy, or CAA, which focus on enhancing competency on climate change issue, both Thailand and in Southeast Asia region. As a part of our collaboration, I'm pleased to announce and welcome publication titled South South in Action Capacity Building for Climate Change in Southeast Asia. I would like to thank the UNOS we have supported and cooperated with TGO and JICA in delivering this publication. The publication includes five case studies that illustrate the number of ways the CITC climate change capacity building programs are undertaken in the ASEAN region, including first, building regional training capacity on climate change. Second, regional engagement with the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change. Third, bilateral cooperation between TGO, CITC, and Vietnam. Fourth, TGO and CITC regional conferences. And lastly, the strategic engagement in United Nations climate change conferences. For today's events, in addition to launch of this publication, we are also honored to have representatives from our partner agency, including UNFGC Secretariat, the UNDP, and the ASEAN Secretariat to participate in a panel discussion on the topic of South-South cooperation on enhancing NDC in Southeast Asia region. I'm confident that this discussion will provide interesting insights and encourage further exchange and how we can strengthen our cooperation to support climate action in this region. Before I conclude my remark, as we navigating through these challenging times, I'm impressed that by the continued strong global partnership and community working together to address our collective climate goals. It is determination and ambition that will propel us through this difficult time. I wish you, your team, and your loved one have good health and safety from COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adele, Mr. Morita, and Mr. Ketchai very, uh, for your opening remarks, um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my apologize for the technical problem um, this earlier. But next, may I please to invite Mr. Thawat Chai Sang Kamsuk, Director of Capacity Building and Outreach Office, TGO, to give an introduction of the SSIA publication. Mr. Thawat Chai, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Kopin Krab. And สวัสดีครับ 
everybody. Good, good morning, colleagues. It's nice to meet you here all once again, even it's in a very hard time like this. And uh, this session will bring you to like the emphasize of the publication, what is the highlight in the publication about the CITC works and experience, what uh, we are contributing to the, the ASEAN community in terms of uh, capacity building. And this is the PowerPoint that I would like to uh, share here will be only the highlight from those publications. You can uh, download the publication for detail later via uh, UNOS uh, uh, website and TGO and CITC website. As uh, you can see here that uh, the publication uh, focused on capacity building for climate action in Southeast Asia. This is the uh, fundamental of uh, CITC that uh, uh, we become the uh, capacity building platform for ASEAN region uh, for climate action and to enhance the NDC under the Paris Agreement. The publication uh, starts with the introduction why uh, CITC that uh, building to, to ASEAN. Uh, thank you very much for UNOS and JICA for support to uh, CITC and to the publication. As a uh, CITC, we have a main service, a main three service, uh, just uh, for example, like this on the training. The training is focused on technical issue that uh, it depends on the needs of the ASEAN and the NDC and the Paris Agreement. We have second uh, service on networking that we believe that networking and collaboration enhance capacity building and enhance climate action. And on the third service that uh, we provide knowledge dissemination. This is very important because we have to like uh, educate uh, young people to be the uh, new leader in, in the future to like implement climate ac action in the future. And no, knowledge earlier in, consists of uh, climate science, greenhouse gas inventory, mitigation, adaptation, climate policy, and finance. I'll move on to the first case study, uh, one from five case study. On the first one, on the building regional training capacity, building on climate change, not only adaptation, but climate finance. We based on the uh, need, uh, need base that uh, meet the needs for ASEAN uh, community to enhance capacity building on uh, climate action. On the second case, on regional engagement with AWGCC, we see that this very important that we see this, uh, this platform is very important to like, capacity building and disseminate the knowledge of climate action throughout this region. And we also that uh, supporting AWGCC climate change action plan on capacity building on mitigation and also climate finance. We also jo joining this uh, uh, meeting uh, regularly to like contribute our experience and sharing the knowledge on climate action. And we also like seeking support from uh, ASEAN AWGCC parties to support the capacity building for ASEAN region. The, the next uh, case study on bilateral cooperation between CITC and Vietnam. We have uh, actually uh, have a cooperation with Vietnam to like exchange expert and knowledge on climate actions and also we have activities on like organize a meeting together to be uh, exchanging platform on aspect experience from thailand and vietnam and also that we joining a workshop and also the site even all together the next case study on regional conference CITC regional conference that we organized to like give update about the 
climate change situation around the globe. We invite all uh, speakers and participants from all around the world to exchange uh, practice, best practice on climate change action. And also this uh, platform can uh, build networking and also that uh, the support from North and South and South-South cooperation. And last but not least in the case five, we also engage with the UNFCCC conference that uh, every year we engage to set a side events on climate actions for ASEAN region to uh, contribute our experience and knowledge to global community and also that we can receive a feedback and sharing experience from international participants. And this uh, platform that we can create a cooperation as well. As we, CIDC, we meet with uh, some uh, partners from uh, developed countries and also from UN agency that uh, can support our activities on capacity building for, for the ASEAN. And so finally, and the conclusion and way forward part in the publication, as uh, you can see here that because uh, we're trying to like provide capacity building uh, to the ASEAN or, and also people on not only climate science, we uh, provide on, in ho holistic approach on climate action. We start from climate science, greenhouse gas inventory. When we know our inventory, we have to like reduce greenhouse gas by uh, mitigation measures and also adaptation measures. Once we have um, measures and project and action, action plan ready, we have to like um, build capacity building on climate finance and climate economy to make our act climate action more effective. And during this uh, difficult time of COVID-19, it make us difficult to provide capacity building in face-to-face -face in traditional way. So CITC move on to like digital platform. We, we involve from tra traditional uh, practice to digital platform. We provide capacity building through online training and online workshops. And also we create uh, e-learnings for Thai and ASEAN. So ASEANs and uh, Thai people can uh, learn the climate actions on demand uh, via our website on CAA website. This that show in this uh, PowerPoint, you can go through the website through the QR code and also you can go by the uh, worldwide web uh, show, show here. As uh, the, the times go on, uh, we start from CITC that uh, provide capacity building to, to the ASEAN on climate change uh, action workshops and knowledge uh, management. And um, now that uh, TGO decided to like integrate all our knowledge, not only climate science and climate situation, mitigation and action, we include that uh, the TGO uh, mechanism like um, how to calculate uh, carbon footprint, how to uh, calculate uh, emission reduction from project level from the experience from CDM uh, project that uh, include all areas aspect that, that to, to become the new uh, center called TGO Climate Action Academy, which uh, CITC will, we, will be implement under C CAA, we call CAA, you can go to the, the website uh, via this uh, website. And the CAA have uh, four main uh, services that have involved from, sorry, okay, have involved from the CITC that, okay. Now we provide climate action leaders for Lampor leader to join uh, this action uh, all together. We have a training program for a practitioner and implementer 
we have education program for uh, young people and young leader and also we provide uh, conference and seminar annually to like keep update about the climate action around around the world this is the the all of the uh, public highlight in the publication I, I, I would like to uh, highlight here and I believe that this uh, information would be the good basis for us for the next uh, session on the discussion that uh, talking about climate action and also capacity building and thank you very much for your attention and I'll go back to Mr. Wandobun. Thank you. Swadikar. Thank you very much, Mr. Tawachai, for your presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now for us to share with you a panel discussion on South-South Cooperation on Enhancing NDCs in Southeast Asia region, which will be moderated by Mr. Koti Fukuda. Mr. Ko Koti Fukuda is a Chief Technical Advisor from Japan International Cooperation Agency, or JICA. He was a chief advisor to support the project for capacity building to accelerate low carbon and resilient society realization in Southeast Asia, operated by TGO CITC. Before we start the session, may I please ask our panelists to turn on your camera while we, we are at the, this um, panel discussion. Thank you. Well, I believe Mr. Fukuda is ready. Mr. Fukuda, please uh, start your session. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Uh, th thank you, MC, for your kind introduction. And once again, good morning and Saudi Cup to everyone. Uh, welcome to this online panel discussion, South South Cooperation on Enhancing DC in Southeast Asia. Uh, my name is Keoji Fukuda, I'm a Chief Advisor of JICA's uh, Climate Technical Cooperation in DC. Joining you today from, not from Bangkok, but from Vietnam. And it's such a privilege to moderate this session. Um, thank you, for organizers, to invite me back to this regional community. And up until last year, I was also based in Bangkok to take part in this collaborative initiative with UNOS and TGO and our regional co collaboration. And my con heartiest congratulations for successful delivery of the product. So that said, today's topic is quite interesting. So we are to examine climate change from the perspective of regional cooperation encompassing South-South Triangular cooperation, and in particular, how such mode of cooperation further leverages climate ambition and or expedites in this implementation in this region. So in order to deep dive into the topic, this morning we are very privileged to have such an excellent panel joining us. So let me take this opportunity to briefly introduce them. Okay, starting from uh, uh, UNFCCC, we have Mr. Yen Wachinski. Morning, Yen. Uh, he's uh, serving as a lead of the Regional Collaboration Center for Asian Pacific, RCC Bangkok, and is currently providing oversight for regional activities on carbon market, carbon pricing, capacity building for CDM, particularly for DNAs, MRV transparency, and the support, and not to mention uh, climate finance. So welcome aboard, Yen. And next up uh, from UNDP, we have Mr. Manuel Soriano, a Regional Technical Advisor, RTA, uh, Energy Climate Change, sitting in UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub. And Mr. Soriano joined the uh, UNDP GF in 2000 as a GF Regional Coordinator for Climate Change in this region. And is currently supporting the design, development, and implementation of UNDP GF Climate Change Project, as well as CDM and the Green Climate Fund in the region. Welcome, Mr. Noel. And next we have a Dr. Dennis Nkala from uh, UNOS and the regional coordinator of the Office for the Asia Pacific. And Dr. Nkala has also extensive experience in the region, assuming his regional functions starting from 2006 and in the past co-authored publication on South-South and Triangular Cooperation in Asia Pacific, which fits to the theme of this uh, discussion. Nice to see you again, Dennis. And next panel, we have a key, key figure from ASEAN Secretariat, uh, Dr. Von Sok. Uh, he's the head of the Environment Division and an Assistant Director of Sustainable Development. And Dr. Sok is a long timer in the field, and he has more than 20 years of experiences in global environmental compliance and uh, governance domain, including uh, strategic planning, 
uh, operation uh, control and environmental management systems implementation, among others. So it's a privilege to have you this morning, Dr. Sok. And then we have another important figure from the region, uh, Mr. Sam Thi, a director of climate change department of Ministry of Environment in Cambodia, and also serving as the chair of uh, AWGCC, ASEAN Ad Hoc Working Group for Climate Change. And for those who are engaged in C negotiation, uh, he's also a familiar face, and he plays a pivotal role in Cambodia in climate change, including focal point for C and IPCC as well. Such a pleasure to see you again, Mr. T. And last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Tawachai Sain Kamsak, serving as the Director of Capacity Building Outreach Office of TGO, who just presented uh, earlier. And he's been leading Climate Change Capacity Building Platform ASEAN and uh, for Thailand for the past several years, and not to mention regular attendee of the C uh, delegation. So welcome aboard, p so those six uh, experts consist the panel today. And just because we have such a wide spectrum panelists with a different backgrounds and expertise. So what I'd like to be doing is to start sort of one-on-one -on -one exchange by asking questions individually and then throwing common question to all. And then later on open up the floor uh, if audiences. And if audiences wish to raise questions to the panel, please use the chat box uh, or text box so that the organizer can collect them and some can be picked up for today. If not, then we follow, follow up after the event. And for the panelists, in view of time given to us, uh, it'd be great if you can sort of summarize your responses around three minutes, and just to give other members uh, enough or sufficient time for sharing their reflections too. So without further ado, uh, let's, let's move on, one-on-one -on -one exchange. So starting from the bigger picture here, I'd like to start with the UNFCCC. Ian, are you up? As we recall the Climate Ambition Summit held last year in December, about 75 leaders uh, from around the world announced the commitment for more ambitious climate actions. And this momentum building effort continued this year uh, with various heads of state meetings, all meant for raising climate ambitions. So as we gear towards COP26 Glasgow uh, later this year, we also see countries effort to raise ambitions through updating NDCs. So speaking of NDCs in this region, so could you tell us what enhancements have made by countries in Southeast Asia and what are the key highlights and where do you see opportunities for elaboration? So Mr. Yen, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Koji. Thank you very much for, for giving me the floor. Yeah, and thank you very much for the organizers of, of this event. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to join this uh, panel. I see so many colleagues. Uh, that's, that's very great. Um, so you asked me for, for a little bit of an uh, overview of enhancement that have been made by countries in the region um, in submitting their updated and new NDCs. So um, just in, in brief, We've received so far um, seven out of, of, out of 10 <clears throat> uh, updated new NDCs from the region. Uh, so hoping that the, the other three will be submitted uh, in time to, to be uh, included in the, in the updated uh, final uh, synthesis report. Uh, but that's, that's a very good progress, I'd, I'd say. And uh, overall, uh, just try to pick out a couple of elements from these NDCs. So most countries have actually um, really uh, aimed to enhance ambitions in, in adaptation as well as in, in mitigation. So we have seen a new um, mitigation targets. Uh, I mean, the, the level of ambition, I'd say, is, is quite different from country to country. But um, we also have to we have to acknowledge that um, we are. This is the first round of NDCs. Countries are still trying to really get a grip of. Nobody, of course, wants to commit uh, to. Um, uh, yeah, commit, overcommit, and uh, it's 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 totally understood uh, that that still needs a little bit of of uh, uh, getting used to to these um, updates. Uh, uh, at the same time, I also want to mention: I mean, we have these circles of updates every five years, but obviously they can also be updated uh, at any time. So I think while, while countries move along, uh, start implementing the NDCs, getting. Uh, 
uh, a better grip of it. I, I think we do also expect to get uh, further updates. Uh, one of the elements that was also very obvious um, compared to the, the first uh, uh, NDC and now updated versions that country had really spent much more time to also look into alignments with national policies and, and mainstreaming uh, into local and sectari <coughs> sectoral development planning. I think in the first round um, that was, um, yeah, not possible. I mean, this, this was a complete new exercise, but now uh, countries really uh, try to understand how to how to mainstream uh, these these um, uh, NDCs. Um, we have seen uh, inclusion of new sectors, like explicit mention of, of new sectors like uh, energy, transportation, but also agriculture and waste, which in, in some of the earlier NDCs uh, was was not as um, as dominant. Um, we also see, I think, country understand much better now. What is the needs for implementation? So expression of capacity needs and, and support needs uh, in DCs have been increased. So uh, obviously there's administrative support and institutional capacity building uh, has been expressed. Uh, also policy design. Um, we see, of course, needs for, uh, um, we're moving from the MRV uh, old MRV system to the enhanced transparency framework. So there's also expression of needs of capacity building and in, in, in transparency measure and reporting and verification. Um, also on, on climate modeling and carbon trading. Um, overall, also, we see a more a strong emphasis on natural-based solution. I think that's uh, not only in this region, but, but overall has become a much stronger emphasis um, also uh, as, as a low-cost uh, option to, to counter uh, climate-induced disasters, uh, at the same time achieve some mitigation uh, outcomes. Um, yeah, uh, mitigation outcomes in terms of co-benefits of adaptation strategy has also been uh, enhanced in, in many of these uh, NDCs. Um, the second part of the question, I think, where do we still see enhancement? I'm not sure if I've used up my uh, my minutes. Uh, just very brief. Uh, I think there is still uh, some some space for further alignments and for development of, of uh, net zero emission goals towards mid century, and and then also aligning the NDCs further to to this goal. And obviously, last year, uh, with the impact of the um, uh, pandemic, there has been a lot of barriers and, and limitations. So I think uh, with um, yeah, recovery from the pandemic, uh, I, we hope that also some of these limitations will be uh, overcome in terms of um, <clears throat> Yeah, finance, uh, of course, capacity building and also consultation, stakeholder in inclusion. Um, overall, um, that, that would be the uh, hope. Also, uh, use of international cooperation. I think there is still some room. Uh, countries have started uh, thinking more and uh, how to use international cooperation compared to the earlier NDC. Some countries have very clearly expressed this. And I think there is still uh, in this region, uh, especially also among the countries of the region, some more uh, room for, for enhancement. I think with this, uh, I think as a first round, I'd like to hand back to you, Koji. Yeah, thank you very much, Xian, uh, for providing us such a nice overview. And uh, we do confirm the effort actually, yeah, for to step up climate ambitions indeed taking place. I think seven out of 10 is already a good start. Also including all this qualitative uh, improvement uh, within NDC, particularly alignment with the national policy and mainstreaming. That's quite important part of it as an impetus to implementation. Thank you very much. That's a very good start to set the scene. Uh, now I'd like to move on to uh, Dennis, uh, Yunos. Uh, good morning, Dennis. And we see this south south triangular cooperation offers a new avenue for supporting developing countries. And I guess this is applicable to um, environment and climate change domain. So having said that, my question is twofold. So what do you think is a role of South-South Triangular Cooperation or uh, regional cooperation broader sense in the context of achieving climate change in DC goals? And second part of it is where do you see opportunities for such regional cooperation 
particularly in the context of uh, Southeast Asia. So you have the floor, Dennis. Thank you very much, uh, Koji, and good morning to all, wherever you are. Uh, nothing quite affects the developing countries of the South like climate change, apart perhaps from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that we've just seen. And as we know, we have rising sea levels, salination of farmlands, droughts, extreme weather incidents, um, all of them are affecting the developing countries. Um, and the impact on them is greater because they are less equipped financially and technologically to deal with climate change. But another aspect that we have to look at when we are looking at the global south is that unlike many other issues, we cannot look at the South as a uh, homogeneous grouping of countries because indeed we have some countries that can be classified as part of the big solution to uh, emissions. At the same time, we have uh, countries which are small and regardless of whatever mitigation activity, they could do, it would not have an impact or a, a major impact. And so we have to look at the South in that context, that small island developing states uh, whose mitigation activities uh, are not very consequential. At the same time, they are threatened with extinction. Uh, they may cease to exist because of the rising sea levels. And then we have the other significant players who are part of the solution. Now trying to answer your question in terms of uh, what can South South and Triangular Cooperation do, let me just refer to the uh, publication in 2017 by the United Nations Office for South South Cooperation and the UNFCCC Secretariat. Uh, that uh, report was called Catalyzing Implementation of Nationally Determined Contributions in the Context of the 2030 Agenda through South South Cooperation. In the report, uh, the analysis was that the NDCs of the developing countries uh, need, they, they suffered from similar constraints, that is financial capacity building, technological needs, uh, and these were in the areas of energy, transportation, waste management, land use, agriculture, water, health, and infrastructure. So a very wide spectrum of areas where we need the technologies and the finance. Regardless of uh, this, however, I want to say that some countries in the South have started to develop the technologies and the solutions to some of these uh, programs. So just to mention one, in fact, some developing countries have demonstrated that there may be an advantage in starting afresh uh, rather than trying to um, let's say, when you have already existing systems and infrastructure, you have to change them. But if you don't have them and you're starting afresh, it's easier to make progress. So we see some investments and we see that uh, some developed countries pledges investments and actions uh, in the energy renewable sector have reached 152.2 billion in 2019, and this um, was the fifth year in which the developing countries had outstripped the developed countries. So there's progress there. So I also want to mention that developing countries are also beginning to gain more expertise in sustainable technology and innovation through the creation of new knowledge and the implementation of projects, and enhancing the development transfer and dissemination of technologies, of course, a very key pillar for international response to climate change. And much has been done through South-South and Triangular Cooperation. Furthermore, in terms of institutionalization, some uh, uh, institutions have been created. I particularly want to mention um, an arrangement, which is the Climate Vulnerable Forum, an organization of 43 developing countries uh, that uh, advocates for shared um, best practices and resources among the developing countries for climate change and adaptation. And 
I must also emphasize that the developing countries still need a lot of assistance from uh, the developed world. And in fact, I need to mention that the common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, um, the principles, is very important. Uh, so it's, it's, we always say in South-South cooperation that South-South cooperation does not replace North-South cooperation. And I think it's the same case here that even though the countries in the South are making their efforts, the vast chunk of the mitigation has to come and be assisted by the countries from the North. Now, coming to your last question on uh, what are the opportunities? And so from what I've said, I think it's clear that uh, financial technological constraints will continue to limit the impact of countries uh, in uh, mitigation and adaptation. But also it is important that uh, to recognize that opportunity may lie in the South investment on climate action. Uh, on this, it is well recognized that access to finance is fundamental for creating momentum and raising ambition. Therefore, attracting tra private sector investment to close the financing gap is very necessary. Some studies have done by UNCTAD and uh, the Finance Corporation, uh, International Finance uh, Corporation, that have shown that Southern investment typically reaches out to more of the developing countries. Southern grown business models and technologies are more often uh, attuned to the needs of conditions in the developing countries and are more flexible and can be adapted faster than investments from developed markets. Uh, this is due to the high relevance of the innovative, contextually tailored business models that the Southern countries uh, uh, can provide. And how can this be done? Uh, I would say that it is important for developing countries to come up with appropriate incentives and financial instruments to support the expansion and market demand and business investment, unlocking the private sector. So we're saying here that there is opportunity, but the countries in the South have to put together a, condu a, condu a, 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 a conducive environment for this investment to take place. So for my first round, I think this is where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for your, very, your insights. And uh, I think you raised a very important point of the diversity in this region. We can't treat the country uh, in a equal manner. That's, that's so true. But at the same time, uh, South-South cooperation does not replace the conventional ones. And uh, the challenge seems to be also common, which is the more on focusing on means of implementation, which is finance, capacity, and technology, and how to uh, build on that. It's, it continues to be the challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, and then moving on to next up is uh, UNDP, Mr. Soliano. Um, UNDP serves as the key implementation arm of the UN system. And I acknowledge that you are very active in the field of climate change. So my question twofold again. So could you tell us uh, what are the key initiatives, programs is undertaken by UNDP in this region? to support countries uh, enhance their indices and also capacity building around it. And second part of it is based on support, your support experiences. What do you think are the biggest challenges that uh, prevent countries from taking actions or stepping up their ambitions? And how can uh, cooperation, regional cooperation help address such challenges? So Mr. Soliano, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Fuda, and uh, <clears throat> and also uh, good morning to uh, everyone uh, particip participating in these discussions. Uh, responding to the questions as to uh, what are the initiatives and programs that were undertaken by UNDP in the in the region to enhance NDCs and associated capacities. Uh, well, the specific program of the UNDP for supporting countries, and that includes some of the ASEAN member states, in enhancing their uh, uh, NDCs uh, is what we call this climate promise. The, the climate promise is UNDP's uh, commitment to ensure uh, that the country, any country wishing to increase the ambition of their 
national climate change under the Paris uh, Agreement to reduce emissions and uh, of greenhouse gas gases that cause global warming is able to do so. Now the support provided uh, uh, draws upon UNDP's extensive uh, portfolio of expertise across priorities areas such as uh, energy, forest, water, resilience, agriculture, health, youth, finance, governance, gender equality, and green jobs. It also builds on, uh, builds upon UNDP's established track record in supporting government to discuss, deliver, and design climate action under the green climate, um, the Paris Agreement. Now, UNDP has agreed the climate promise work plans with 118 countries making it the world's largest uh, offer to support the enhancement of countries' climate pledges. Of course, this includes uh, eight of the 10 uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, I don't know if, there, if there's an uh, update on this, but as far as I know, four of the countries, of the eight countries have already completed and submitted or updated their NDCs. And that program uh, under the climate uh, promise, uh, we provide five key technical areas of support to help countries take bold action to reduce their emissions, increase their resilience to climate impacts, and support uh, sustainable development priorities. Now we work closely with other partners like UNEP, UNICEF, uh, the GCF and the NDC partnerships we work together on climate action across government and society to advance quality, tackle poverty, and strengthen social and environmental sustainability. Of course, this includes addressing key cross-cutting issues as shown in the country's respective uh, prime, uh, climate promise plans. Under this program, the services offered by by UNDP are based on the experience from previous country support in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, uh, based on assessment of countries' capacity development support needs as they prepare uh, for implementation of the Paris Agreement, in particular their uh, NDCs, as well as the capacity development or technical assistance needs related to NDC uh, implementation. So that's what uh, the UNDP is doing with regards to helping countries in, <clears throat> in preparing or uh, enhancing their NDCs. Now, with regards to the, the second question as to the biggest challenges uh, that prevent countries from stepping up their ambitions, uh, climate uh, ambitions. Now, uh, going through some of those uh, <clears throat> Uh, climate uh, promise plans of the countries, uh, you know, found out <clears throat> that the, there were three, three main uh, challenges. Uh, <clears throat> uh, these are data availability, international, the need for international assistance and interministerial or cross-sectoral uh, cooperation and coordination. The, the, the issue of data availability, okay, the, the, the non-availability of reliable data and the lack of capacity for analysis of data prevents clearer understanding of several elements of the NDCs, such as ambition and fairness, as well as scope and type, economic impact and co-benefits and, uh, and others. With regards to uh, uh, international support uh, to enhance the ambition for NDCs and also to implement them uh, international support in the form of finance, technology development and transfer and capacity building is uh, uh, needed. Okay, so this would be available in order for the countries to really uh, increase their ambition for their NDCs and also for them to be able to implement the, the actions to <clears throat> to implement the, their NDCs. And lastly, this issue about uh, interministerial and cross-sectoral cooperation coordination, uh, because of this problem, uh, 
this challenge ultimately reduces the sectoral scope and potential ambition of the of some of the uh, NDCs. So in general, the increased ambition of NDCs is made contingent on the provision of support such as finance, technology, and institutional capacity building. Of course, also the COVID-19 pandemic has had, has had an adverse impact on many parties and the preparation process leading to challenges in improving ambition and in meeting the preparation uh, uh, timelines. Now, how can, uh, how can South, South cooperation be uh, useful for, for this? Now, I will, only, I will answer based on what we do uh, with regards to uh, projects that we implement or develop and implement in the, in the various countries, including in the Asian countries. Uh, <clears throat> uh, with regards to including South-South cooperation aspects in the project. So, so some of the Asian countries share actually characteristics when it comes to the promotion and, and application of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies. So some of these countries have common or similar economic, technological, and capacity-related challenges and constraints when implementing policies and measures towards achieving low emission and climate res resilient development. So these similar challenges provide opportunities for mutual learning and cooperation. Thus, climate change mitigation and adaptation projects that the UNDP develop and implement in some of the Asian countries are actually also designed to support the sharing of experience gained and materials developed with other countries in the region for example, via information exchange and sharing networks. Now, the pertinent uh, UNDP country office uh, <clears throat> uh, that is implementing the, the project will be the one who will be spearheading the liaison work to ensure relevant parties in the region know about the project and the, you know, this information sharing network. So we think that the uh, South and South-South uh, cooperation related activities of our projects uh, after this includes interventions that are intended to share opportunities for replication of the interventions in other countries. Projects are designed to include activities that will explore opportunities for meaningful participation in specific events where UNDP could support engagement with the regional discourse that is directly related to the project's subject or contributing to related general subjects such as energy access or sustainable energy or NDC implementations. So such projects are designed to provide opportunities for regional or even international cooperation with countries that are implementing similar initiatives that are promoted and implemented under the project. So I, I would say that uh, here in ASEAN, the close proximity and similar conditions and circumstances and geopolitical and socioeconomic relationship between countries in the regions can contribute to their ability to work together. Yeah? Through South-South cooperation, countries can benefit from their comparative advantages and creativity and can transform uh, challenges into opportunities. And in regards to the NDCs, the Asian countries I think have prioritized similar climate adaptation and mitigation objectives. So uh, through South-South cooperation, uh, this could be, uh, be a viable approach to sharing experience, knowledge, and expertise between the ASEAN countries with regards to climate policy development and implementation. So for this first round of questions, uh, those are my answers. Over to you, Koji. Thank you, Mr. Noel. I think you pretty much answered all the questions. <laughs> all right, and th thank you very much for your comprehensive uh, uh, yeah, uh, response to that. And particularly, we are very encouraged to know that you have this uh, massive climate promise uh, uh, program up and running. So that would definitely uh, push uh, move forward all the ambitions and implementation. And also a very important point uh, that, uh, yeah, uh, basically to start with sort of similarities, you know, uh, share it across the region as the basis for 
uh, South South Cooperation, the regional cooperation. Thank you. And now uh, I would like to invite Dr. Von Stock from ASEAN Secretariat. <clears throat> Because uh, you are such a long timer in this region and the topic, I'd like to seek your wisdom and a two set of questions for you again. So first one, at the moment, NDC is more or less discussed in the context of individual country, but I believe the regional institution like ASEAN has a role to play to facilitate the NDC enhancement. So can you tell us how ASEAN approaches to uh, climate actions in the region? And second part of it is based on your regular interaction with the member states. Uh, do you see any sign of regional collaboration uh, in the domain of climate change? And what do you think can be done more? Dr. Bonsok, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for your um, question. That's just why important question. I mean, it's not only the, your question alone, but many other would like to know about what ASEAN doing and particularly with the NDC and uh, the new ambition that what we should do. And also our partner, including our UN agency. So, um, I mean, as you may know, ASEAN is just uh, the association of 10 ASEAN member states. So with that, you may see there's some common, there's some differences. So uh, with that, it's very clear there are some differences that we need to deal with. So, I mean, the difference here and the common, it also works within the climate change itself. For example, common with the NDC thing, but how we can address with the different sort of um, uh, capacity where it is in line with also um, the panelist member just highlight about the common but different shared sort of responsibility and respective capability of the member state. So uh, this is the way ASEAN doing in line, I mean, exactly in line with the uh, United C uh, principle. So why we go with that? I mean, you may see this slow, but I mean, ASEAN way, we don't see that slow. I think we are proud of our system. One thing that to be uh, note, I mean, about the, uh, the, the principle way that we have, I mean, we want to walk together. We walk together slow, if you want to walk alone, that may be fast, but it's not really create great impact when you try to address our common issue. So that is about the way that if you want to walk fast, maybe walk alone. But when you want to walk um, together and get uh, great more impact, that is the way we walk together. And that's the ASEAN form. Okay. So we believe that we all do better when we work together. That is the point of ASEAN. With that, I think uh, we're proud of our system. Why I just would like to highlight a few things for, for, for the meeting. One, we have the well established governance system to address climate change. Why we say this is well established? We, we have a sector dedicated for that. I mean, we have ASEAN Minister uh, on Environment that oversight and guide the direction of that um, the climate change aspect. With that, we have ASEAN senior official on environment who taking care of the operational level about what is the best way forward for ASEAN. And also dedicated working group, ASEAN working group um, on climate change. And today with me, I have the chair of the working group. That is the way he can elaborate more how the working group dealing with that climate change issue and particularly with NDC. The third point, I think uh, the, the next uh, governance system I can say is about ASEAN chairmanship. Each year ASEAN chair have uh, prioritized regularly as a champion on climate change. You may recall on 2018, Singapore as uh, the chair also provide important uh, platform to have a special ASEAN ministerial meeting on climate action, where they also uh, invite also the expense session to other partners to join. And also this is the way we take stock where we are at and what we, where we need to go. And, and this is the way we also report um, accountably to the UNFCCC and other uh, people. Uh, I mean, that is the, the way uh, as in chair and, and continuously as in chair still prioritize climate change till now as key issue and, and, and for the region to address from both mitigation and adaptation. The third strategy and then the third, third point that ASEAN doing is about partnership development. That is may fall to your third question. ASEAN work with partner. So we have a number of partner and 
uh, including the uh, you know the central, the dialogue partner, and the strategic partnership with other. I mean, like EU, like many other countries dealing with ASEAN. So with that, I think uh, this is the way we come to a stronger and solid that we can advance further a number of issue of the uh, NDC enhancement through, uh, for example, such as some speaker already highlight about the capacity building, information sharing, best practices, as well as you know the technology transfer or the also the um, the uh, financing sort of mechanism. Of course, they all cannot be addressed at once. They have some, uh, some uh, piece of meal that we need to uh, move together. So with that, I believe this is the way uh, we work together with all partners. And uh, my uh, participation today is really um, uh, important also to confirm this also the way we try to support the South-South cooperation because we're not working with alone uh, or a single sort of partner or sector. We work with the multi-sector, multi-partner. And then what our approach is about multi-stakeholder engagement. We work with the differences. We work with the order. That's the way we, we try to achieve our climate target. So um, among other, I mean, the way we said that we work together and we work uh, collectively uh, with all player, partner, and, and so on. This not mean only the government sector. Private sector play important role. I'm not mean to pinpoint to the private sector, but the, but the reality, the contribution for city, the city development, for infrastructure development, for energy sector development, for agricultural development, for many other sectors involve private sector, no matter how. So I think the way we engage everyone in uh, the responsible action, this is most important. And um, for example, one other thing that um, previous speakers highlight about the uh, technology transfer. This is one of the most important to make it available, uh, climate friendly technology, the best, the least option available to the region. Why people not choose that when the things available? I mean, how did it become available when there no investment, no research and development from private sector? That's why I mean the private sector could be the champion and like, you know, renewable energy and so on. So that's why the least, the, the least and the best option available uh, made to the region that the way we can advance further, uh, among other things. And, and uh, the, the, the last part I, I would like to highlight with this sort of um, private sector play important role in terms of climate financing. I mean, as a win-win uh, approach where they can, you know, uh, make their business up to running, but also help the government and, and the climate change as well. So uh, with that, I believe uh, all the key players, even the community, promote the uh, good practice or best practice. This is the way we can um, address the climate change. So it's not one single bulletproof to sort out this sort of common uh, climate issue. So we all are a part of the solution, that's what we can say. Mm -hmm. And um, with ASEAN, we try to make uh, this as collective effort that we believe we can share, we can support, and we can walk along the way together. So this is the way we can alert each other, we can accompany each other and also try to, you know, you know, get this sort of technical, technical support and trans, techn technology transfer as well, or, or financial at certain level from bilateral to bilateral cooperation. So um, I think this is the way we are and, and I see some opportunity uh, coming. I mean, uh, for example, with ASEAN itself, we have ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. Uh, I mean, that in response to the COVID-19 situation, where it, it spelled out something very clear in terms of uh, uh, climate change. For example, it's about the um, to build something more uh, resilient and green recovery. So, what it does mean, the green recovery here, it's about the way try to capture nature-based solution and promote more uh, in terms of um, ASEAN green um, 
sort of investing in natural capital where we can, you know, promote sort of carbon sink and so on. And, and, and also we have uh, launching also, uh, no, prepared the launching for the ASEAN Green Initiative where we try to promote more uh, nature-based solution to the climate change and to the people. So with that, I think this is a great opportunity uh, provide to the, uh, to the region and, and to the member state. So with the ASEAN Recovery Framework, we have clear um, the broad strategy files spell out about this sort of um, need. And this open door for the partner to jump in and to join hand together with us. So uh, I think um, with that also the South South Corporation come to play. And I believe uh, the uh, South South Corporation may look not only information sharing, but also may advance further our cooperation in terms of, you know, make sort of a technology uh, transfer, make uh, the, um, the uh, financing access to finance and so on. We have a number of um, process at ASEAN level that we have uh, some uh, progress. For example, I just would like to highlight quick, I mean, before I forgot about the uh, ASEAN State of Climate Change Report. You may feel like, oh, State of Climate Change Report simple, but not simple. This is one of the uh, approach that we take stock where we are at. And then there's a way also we try to ident identify what are the transformative action that we need. And also the way how we can do this in transparency manner across the, re the region. So this is the way we believe. And then with that, we come up with also clear vision and a mission what we can do better in, at the region, at the country level. And with that, we work also with the UNFCC, uh, uh, FCC, RCC, uh, with Jen about the climate financing. We are looking for the means to implement that sort of uh, vision and mission. And um, along the line, we have also the LTS, the long-term strategy development, try to provide what is the stepping stone for the member state or the sector who would like to take part in this sort of uh, process, how to identify, how to do better for their emission, for their uh, NDC. And um, with that, we have uh, clear about the ASEAN Climate Change Partnership Conference that we organize regularly every year. Unfortunately, for the 2020-21, it, it, it doesn't happen because of, as you may know, the disruption of the COVID-19 that happened uh, to the region and to all over the place. That, that thing not really uh, happened. Why is that uh, important? The Climate Change Partnership Conference provides an important platform for uh, partners to learn and to mobilize their force and to harmonize their effort and standardize sort of uh, approach to achieve uh, collectively our common target. So that is our situation and our challenge. And we, I believe that the South South Cooperation will uh, further support and in line clearly with the, uh, our ASEAN uh, Comprehensive Recovery, as well as uh, with uh, ongoing uh, strategy and plan on climate action from ASEAN Secretary side. Thank you very much. The floor back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Von Sok, for your, uh, your insight and particularly uh, highlighting the principle, underlying principle of uh, working uh, together slow instead of working alone. And that, that's very important part of the, uh, also highlight the partnership and then also uh, highlighting the ways uh, to uh, establish, uh, utilize established governance system to move forward. And thank you so much for that. And I'd like to move on to Cambodia uh, as a, a chair of the AWCC, Mr. Dei. I have also two set of questions. Um, first of all, uh, as the AWCC, uh, you know, the, the working group is well positioned to facilitate, I think, peer-to-peer -peer learning, joint effort for industry implementation. So from that working group's perspective, what do you think can be done more to expedite in the C at the regional level? And do you have any example of uh, the working group facilitating such regional, regional collaboration. And then second question is back to your country, uh, Cambodia. I think uh, Cambodia is also updated in DC uh, by uh, December 2020 last year. So could you tell us a little bit about the highlights, uh, how the NDC has been uh, elaborated compared to the previous one? So Mr. T, give the floor. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Pukura uh, san and uh, good morning uh, from Cambodia. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, well, uh, 
I see uh, Dr. Wong Sok has all already elaborated more about ASEAN uh, action to address climate change. But I just would like to add uh, more uh, on how ASEAN Working Group uh, doing, what is the priority for ASEAN uh, Working Group on climate change, uh, AWGCCC. Uh, ASEAN uh, is a uh, 10 country uh, and uh, I think uh, we have different constraints uh, in terms of uh, development and also uh, the capacity to address the climate change. Anyway, uh, we try to identify what is the common issue among ASEAN, uh, especially in terms of implementation uh, to address the climate change. Uh, in that, uh, ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change has an action plan, and uh, we also update it regularly uh, every year. Uh, what is the priority for us? Uh, what has been achieved so far? Uh, this including uh, climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation, uh, uh, long term. Uh, uh, long-term planning and assessment of the indices, um, climate finance, uh, climate modeling and assessment, uh, MOV and greenhouse gas um, stock taking, uh, technology transfer, and also the cross-sectoral uh, cooperations. There are important uh, initiatives has been proposed uh, and uh, we need to realize that uh, how to move forward to implementation. Uh, this including uh, strengthening uh, implementation of ASEAN member state, uh, NDCs through NDCs, through ASEAN NDCs partnership. Uh, second is uh, strengthening uh, ASEAN member state capacity on implementation in hand transparency framework on NDC stock uh, take, uh, sorry, NDC tracking progress on mod modality, procedure, guideline, and the Paris Agreement. And the third is the enhancing NDC through nature uh, based solution. The fourth is the achieving NDC through operationalization of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Um, I, as identified and also mentioned by Dr. Wong Sok, uh, win of implementation, I think, is very important uh, for us. And uh, I see uh, currently the partner more focused only on the capacity buildings, peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, learning, uh, how the implementation of NDC. But the real uh, important thing, I think, uh, is country has put the target uh, under the NDC uh, and how to achieve that, that target. Yeah. I think the mid implementation of each activity uh, of the target uh, is very important for us in the uh, member state. And uh, we can see the common interest, for example, uh, each country, uh, each ASEAN country has the issue on the waste management, waste to energy, and I see uh, most uh, ASEAN country has put uh, activity, uh, real activity, but how to implement that? Uh, for example, I see in Thailand also propose uh, waste to energy. Cambodia also uh, have the same uh, uh, activity to reduce greenhouse gas emission from the waste management. So I think the real uh, situation is to how to mobilize the resource to implement the proposed activity and also the target uh, for each country. And uh, the important thing is uh, the internal uh, country coordination process. I think that is also important. Each country, they have uh, uh, NDC focal point, uh, UNFCC focal point, uh, but uh, the real uh, actor in each country is the line ministry who has mandate uh, to implement the, the target, uh, the proposed target. The NDC coordination uh, focal point or UFCC just coordinate the process. Uh, so I think the partner should 
also look at uh, what is the real need for each country uh, uh, in achieving the uh, energy target on the country. That is the uh, most important thing I think we, we should look at that. Uh, back to Cambodia, I think uh, Cambodia last year has uh, submitted our updated NDCs and we include uh, both adaptation, mitigation, and also with uh, implementation. And uh, we uh, that uh, for the mitigation part, as we have proposed our target, uh, we need to reduce uh, our GAG emission uh, by uh, 41.7% of uh, in baseline emission. So how can we achieve that? I think that is very important uh, to, to look at that. Uh, and for adaptation, it's also very important for Cambodia uh, uh, because we, are, we don't emit more, but we suffer more uh, from climate change. Uh, so we have to look at the, uh, uh, the adaptation, what kind of strategy that Cambodia should address. Uh, as uh, this year, also last year, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, uh, Dr. Bong Sok already mentioned uh, recovery strategy is very important. So we have to address both climate change and also uh, COVID-19 uh, recovery. Uh, I think that is the, the key point that we, we need to look at. In terms of the NDC costing uh, for uh, Cambodia, uh, the adaptation we have proposed, uh, we need at least uh, uh, 5.8 billion US dollars uh, to implement our NDCs. And the uh, mitigation, we need uh, 2.1 uh, billion US dollars to implement uh, our target. So this is the, uh, the country is did uh, the final support and uh, how to achieve that. This is the very important, I think we have to look at uh, uh, how to mobilize, how to uh, identify the mean of implementation for our NDC. Uh, I say it's maybe not only Cambodia, but also other developing country, uh, maybe they need uh, and they still discuss uh, in the climate change negotiation uh, when uh, uh, we have uh, uh, very li limited capacity uh, uh, to uh, achieve our target, where should we find uh, the resource? Uh, as I said, uh, uh, in Cambodia, uh, we also need uh, to have to strengthen our coordination process uh, within the line industry uh, uh, to achieve our target. Uh, for example, Ministry of Mine and Energy, uh, they dealing with the um, uh, renewable energy uh, in our NDCs, uh, Ministry of Public Work and Transport, they also work working on the uh, mo uh, e-mobility, uh, uh, of uh, urban planning, uh, they also propose some activity to uh, reduce emission from construction. So that is the, uh, uh, the sector we need to build uh, capacity. Um, I Finally, I think uh, the uh, publication today, I think it's very, also very important uh, to learn. And uh, we would like to thank uh, Thailand and also the uh, partner to produce this uh, publication. And I think it uh, can be a learning process for us yeah, uh, in terms of capacity building. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank uh, uh, Thailand and the organizer for inviting me to share and to uh, uh, speak in this occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. T, for providing both the original perspective through WGCC and also uh, your uh, issues associated with the, the country. And that, that's common, I think, across all countries. Thank you very much. And mindful time, uh, I'd like to move on quickly to uh, TGL, uh, Mr. Tui. Uh, your office has been operationalizing this climate change capacity building platform to enhance climate actions, not only to Thailand, but also to the regional stakeholders. 
so over the wide range of topics that uh, to cover. So can you tell us what are the key lessons uh, you've drawn from this capacity building effort and what do you think needs to be done more to, to enhance actions? Uh, Mr. Tui. Thank, thank you, Koji, uh, for your question. I, I actually have uh, several points I would like to, to make here that because uh, we dealing with uh, climate change impact, which is a cross-cutting cross -cutting issue that uh, if, even though that climate change impact uh, uh, is different from country to country. So we have uh, different uh, implementation, different uh, experience and different uh, the practice how to deal with the climate climate change impact. So, uh, in order to like provide uh, effective capacity building from uh, my experience on uh, oper operating uh, CITC, that um, we need uh, need based training program that we have to like uh, survey and to study the the real needs of each. Uh, ASEAN country, what, what they need in terms of uh, climate change implementation at, at NDC to achieve the Paris Agreement. So um, we create um, a specific uh, training program that match to the needs of ASEAN member states. And also that uh, another point that uh, I, I, I would like to make a, a point here that, okay, because um, from our uh, experience from uh, inviting participants to join our workshop and training that uh, because um, several countries that uh, climate change implementation is still very new for, for them. So basic learning on climate change needs to be provided before moving forward to training and workshop together in order to make uh, that, that even uh, effective to the participants and also the workshop, uh, I mean, uh, technical workshop style is more effective than uh, lecture style because uh, participants can like uh, contribute to the capacity building workshops and they not only uh, can learn from speakers or um, facilitator, they can learn from each other and they can actually share their knowledge and experience and expertise uh, from their perspective that make the capacity building and workshop more effective and uh, I mean more more fairly and also they can like create their networking all together from the workshops and they can like continue their networking to share the updates situation and experience and knowledge on climate uh, after that. And uh, last point that I, I, I would like to make here that because we are facing a uh, catastrophic on COVID-19 that um, make us difficult on uh, implementing capacity building in traditional way like face to face because because it's it's, it's really costly because of uh, logistic and and so on, and we have uh, limited limited budget because our national budget have to move to uh, to to help the grow economic uh, back to to norm to normal and to help us survival people at, at the moment. So um, cooperation like in the next in international cooperation, whether bilateral or triangular cooperation is still essential during this time. Because, okay, um, not only the uh, budget to support the capacity building event, but uh, contribution in terms of um, technical support is uh, also very useful that's uh, that I would like to make the points here. Thank you, Koji. Thank you very much, Mr. Tui, for sharing the lessons and also important part of trans this uh, process to uh, digital transformation of the mode of uh, capacity building. So that's a challenge for every one of us too. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we are about time, but 
I just wanted to have a very quickly the next uh, question. And I just want to uh, select just a few of your panelists and to respond. That's, that's something already tapped on by Mr. Von already, but uh, it's about the uh, recovery part of it. So if you indulge me, let me just uh, keep you uh, briefly. Uh, many people believe that COP26 uh, Glasgow uh, is a particular importance because it is postponed one year and it's economic impact, the pandemic hit our society, I think governments have the opportunity to think through how they can integrate economic ambitions uh, into uh, while devising domestic uh, recovery plan to reach new normalcy. So uh, where do you think the opportunities lie in this region to achieve resilient green recovery while also meeting the climate pledges? And I'd like to hear your thoughts on potential of green recovery for Southeast Asia. And mindful time, I just wanted to pick Yen uh, from Triple C because you're based in Bangkok. I just wanted to hear your view. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this recovery part of it? Thank you, uh, Koji. I, I, if I understand right, uh, you're asking me. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to, to say, I mean, um, the question is framed in a way like how can uh, recovery support the climate action or the climate pledge. And I, I think there's actually an opportunity to, to turn the whole thing around. Uh, I think we, we still need to see that climate action is, is also, uh, it's maybe in the larger uh, crisis uh, that we are still facing despite this, this devastating uh, pandemic. Uh, so I think actually we still need to look at the, the, the opportunities of, of tackling the climate crisis um, and using economic instruments to, to uh, create a greener economy, um, how this can also help us to build uh, back better or build, build, have a come into a green recovery uh, plan. So I, I think uh, still look at the opportunity of tackling climate crisis to, to um, also um, overcome the, the pandemic um, impact and and i think uh, some some very concrete actions uh, definitely what needs to happen not only in this region but also in this region um, uh, a, a de-investment of uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, technology certainly no uh, new investment into um, into fossil fuel and, and coal power plants and and, and uh, so forth. So actually, really, there needs to happen a shift of, of these investments into green uh, technologies. That's that's very important. Uh, at the same time, also reduce um, fossil fuel subsidies. It, it may sound like an, uh, um, uh, a, a difficult time to do so because it will increase prices for consumers. But at the, on the other hand, if you really use then also mechanisms as, as carbon pricing, for example, to, to give incentive for, for green uh, investments and give these, um, these benefits back to the consumer. I think that's still one of the most important uh, um, areas uh, we need to tackle. And then, of course, we um, I think with this de-investment from ground into green uh, uh, technologies, we also really have to get the private sector uh, more involved uh, and, and create incentives for private sector to, to also um, benefit and, and also contribute to the recovery. Um, and uh, I know the time is limited, so I, I'm just looking where can I where can I cut it. I think there is still a huge potential, of course, in in um, uh, responsible consumption and and production patterns. I, I, I think we we only start to understand uh, how the economy has to has to move and has to. Um, shift in, into this direction and for all this of course international uh, um, cooperation it's been mentioned uh, a lot of times today but it is uh, very important international uh, cooperation in climate finance and and also technology transfer is absolutely uh, is, uh, essential and then um, i think uh, to give others the opportunity to also contribute i i'd uh, just stop it here and give back to you koji Thank you very much, Yen. In fact, yeah, that, that summarizes yeah, the most of the parts. And uh, I think uh, I, I'll have to <laughs> come to stop the, the conversations. And uh, well, 
th thank you so much for your responses. And uh, given the time, actually already passed, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, take uh, indulge me, if you indulge me, I'd like to sort of start summarizing the session. And for those uh, questions uh, received uh, through the comments, uh, let us uh, respond to you uh, individually uh, later uh, on, if you could accept that uh, process. So ladies and gentlemen, we're about to come to this end of session. Uh, let me try to uh, sort of pick some of the takeaways from the today's session. And we have received a lot of insight inputs and it's hard to summarize in fact, but uh, with respect to uh, the point of how NDC uh, can be enhanced, I think that uh, there are so many opportunities available and already uh, presented by the uh, presenters and particularly, and there, but there are many issues as well uh, to unlock uh, many of the challenges uh, facing the country, uh, which also include, for example, the potential in wise the alignment with the net zero target in the coming years. Also, how to uh, sort of uh, ad address dual challenges of pandemic uh, recovery through the greening investment and and uh, so forth. And also, uh, what the, uh, Mr. D highlighted is quite important with respect to the uh, potential for South South cooperation. I think we're not only looking at the capacity building, but we need to go beyond because needs are changing. How to how to uh, address the target and how to do things. So uh, I think that's the the uh, the next uh, homework for everyone uh, to think through how to unlock those how to uh, question uh, type of capacity. But at the same time, the links to uh, the comment raised by um, Mr. Soriano, it's it's when it comes to like transparency and how to part of it, it's more or less like evidence. How to collect evidences to making sure that we are progressing. So that comes back to data. And that's very fundamental that maybe uh, there are rooms for improvement. So that's uh, another thing that uh, I took as a uh, takeaway for further improvement. And again, Dr. Bonsok raised a very important point as a fundamental principle that we work together. And I don't think we are working slow, but at least we're not working alone. So that the principal partnership is, is the, the key for success. But at the same time, uh, really the focusing on uh, how to engage the private sector or non state actors. This is going beyond uh, the traditional public sector, but that's the key because they are the custodian of technology. They are, they are the ones to unlock finance gaps. So that's something that we need to collectively uh, think through how to really engage and commit in a meaningful manner. And uh, with respect to the uh, COVID-19, uh, the green recovery, Yes, we hear that there are potentials and we should look at the uh, opportunity side and maybe the, the best way to starting from really revisiting the investment side to make it green. So there are many other things to be said, but those are the, uh, the, the key highlights that, uh, that I have taken from the discussions. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think uh, we are already passing the time. So I'd like to close the session. So please join me the uh, big round of applause to uh, all the panelists here with us today for being such a good panel. And I'll be, uh, okay, I'll pass the microphone back to uh, MC Copra. Thank you very much, Kapun Kap. On behalf of the organizers, thank you very much to our moderator, our distinguished discussants, and all participants for your attention and valuable contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, before we close uh, this event, I would like to share the screen, uh, the link for download the publication, The South South in Action Capacity Building for Climate Action in Southeast Asia. And we have reached the end of this event, and I hope you find this event useful and you can at least gain the perspective on the South-South Cooperation on Climate Action. Ladies and gentlemen, before the end, I would like to invite you all to return to the main room to join the panel discussion on the topic of Thai municipality and climate ambitions which our uh, admin has provided the link in the chat box below. And we also hope you enjoyed the event and we're looking forward to your participation in our future programs. We would like to conclude our event now. Okay. Thank you very much. 
สวัสดีค่ะ Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.